morning. morning. So if you've been here even even just a little bit or maybe you were with us last night, you know that when I was younger, I uh, spent some time teaching English in a third world country called Azerbaijan. I did that because it was a place that you couldn't share the gospel uh, uh, legally. There was a lot of punishment for that. Uh, And so the thing that was interesting about that was as as just a boy from the Midwest, from from the Hoosier State, from Indiana, it was quite the life-changing experience for me. There were several moments where our team was in life-threatening danger, and, and I'm not talking about the death by Dorito, if you were with us last night that I was talking about. I'm talking danger that was willed upon us. And so I can remember that the first thing was we got in country, and the couple that we were supposed to meet with uh, that were going to show us around, show us who we were supposed to live, well, they didn't show up. We found out some days later it's because they got caught secretly selling Bibles out of their bookstore. So they've been tied up and pistol whipped and left for dead. Uh, and then there was the time that, that a couple of our young females on our team, the, 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 there were some young Azari men that tried to kidnap them and force them off the bus. But that's not a story for today. Maybe we'll share that in the third week of this. Uh, but probably the, the worst instance was in the, the days leading up to our planned departure. Uh, because in, in those days, the Azari government... They took our passports, and they kept them, and they refused to give them back to us. And it it was their hope that that we would be in country when our visas expired, and they could throw us in prison. And so what that meant was we had to go to the Azari government building to try to get our passports back. And none of us wanted to go to the Azari government building, because that was a building we walked by every single day on the way to school. It was three or four stories tall, made completely of marble. It it stood in direct contrast to the dilapidated buildings on either side of it. And every day that we walked by that building, there were two armed guards with AK-47s that would point them at us and pretend to shoot us as we walked by. And so I can still remember the day that we had to go through those doors. Uh, We approached the building and we're being led by gunpoint into the buildings. And when I happened to catch a glimpse, there was a a little space, a little crack in the marble that I could see through. And it changed everything. Because I walked over to it and I peered into it and I realized this wasn't a building made of marble at all. This was a building that was covered with very, very thin pieces of marble slab. It was meant to look like it was a marble building. But all of those empty, hollow spaces were actually filled with literal bags of trash. It was all a facade meant to drive fear into our hearts. And so that changed the way we approached it. We walked up the steps confidently. We walked in. We demanded they give us our passports back or we'd call the embassy. They immediately handed them over and said, we hope you had a great stay in our country. We hope to see you again. And we walked out. Here's what we're doing today. We're we're starting a a brand new series that's simply called Hidden Curses. And and Hidden Curses are a lot like the Azari government building. They look really good on the outside. They look good from a distance, but at their core, if you look closer, upon closer inspection, they aren't what they appear to be. They're just there. It's a facade meant to make us fearful. Fearful. And so that's what hidden curses are. They're something by Satan. It's a lie that appears to be good on the surface, but its intent is to disrupt our lives, to drive us into fear, discouragement, loneliness, and anxiety. And so we're going to have a theme statement for this whole series, and our theme statement that describes that is this. Disturbing lies are at the root of discouraged lives. Okay, I need to say that again so you don't miss it. Disturbing lies are always at the root of discouraged lives. And what I mean when I say that is this. There are things in this life that cause us discouragement. As we believe the lies and live under the lies that Satan desires instead of living in the way that God designed us to live. And when we live under these hidden curses, they look good from far away. They really do. But when we get close, we realize they're actually made of trash. Right, so what we're going to be doing each week is we're going to be contrasting a, a, a disturbing lie that causes discouragement in our life, and we're going to be contrasting that with the truth of the gospel that sets us free from it. And, and so the first week, our first lie that we want to hit today is this. It is the lie that the more options you have, the happier you will be. And I call this the hidden curse of too many choices. 
And it is a hidden curse because we all think, almost always, having more options is a good thing, right? Or is it? And they did a study a couple years ago. It was a combined study, Stanford and Columbia University. And they went to an upscale supermarket. And they did three tests. They all proved conclusively the same thing. We're just going to cover the first one today. But at this upscale supermarket, they set up two different sets of jam at two different times. And one of them was an extensive set. It was 24 different jam flavors. And at the other one, they set up a limited set of six flavors. And here's what they they monitored. They wanted to to monitor how attraction impacted purchasing power. And, And so what they did was they took all the people that passed by the booth, and they decided how many people, what percentage of them, stopped and sampled jams. And of all of the people that passed by the extended set of 24 jams, 60% of them stopped and sampled the jam. And of all the people that passed by the limited set of six jams, here's what they they came to understand. Only 40% of those people stopped to sample the jam. And so they concluded from the beginning something very interesting, that having more options greatly increased interest in sampling the jams. Here's where it gets interesting. Uh, Of the limited set of six jams, of all the people that stopped by, 30% of them purchased at least one jar of jam. Of the extended set of 24 jams, 3% purchased. And so what they concluded was this, and they did this with with multiple things, that having more options greatly increased how interested we are in sampling, but it greatly decreases the likelihood that we will make any type of commitment. We did the same thing, uh, Chris and I, uh, a few years back when Redbox was a thing. We would uh, go maybe every couple weeks and and grab one or two movies. And that was an exciting time. And, And every single one of those movies, as long as our DVD could play the scratch DVD, our player. Kids today never have any clue what we went through, right? As long as our, our, my PlayStation 4 could play that scratch DVD, we watched it, except once. We, we rented Puss in Boots. It was so terrible, we turned it off immediately. So 99% of the time, we watched every movie that we rented for years. Now, with streaming options, that matter, Netflix, Prime, right, Amazon, it doesn't matter. There's unlimited movies that you can watch. And I can't tell you how many times that we sit down to watch a movie, and we scroll through all of the options, and what ends up happening is this. We don't watch any of them. We'll spend 30 minutes looking at all the options, get overwhelmed by the options, and just go back and watch a rerun of whatever series of TV we're watching through. Well, they do this with relationships, too. There's more divorce than ever before in history. People are, are, are delaying marriage longer or, or not getting married at all more than ever before in history. And that has exponentially increased with the association of online dating. Because with online dating, you can slide, swipe left or right as many times as you want. It is unlimited choices, which means this. If you ever choose and you commit to one person, you will always be left wondering, if I had just waited a little bit longer would the next one have been better? And so here's what we do in our culture today. We do this over and over again. We decide if I just hold out, the next option might be better, and so we never, ever commit. And so here's what I'm trying to tell you this morning. It is a lie that the more choices you have, the happier you will be. So what is the truth? I'm glad you asked. If you want to turn with me, we're going to be in the book of Galatians, and we're going to be in chapter 1, reading verses 6 through 9, where the apostle Paul is talking to to the Christians in the region of Galatia, and he's dealing with an interesting problem that that feels really familiar to this, and he he starts in verse 6 where he says this. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Now, I don't want to spend our whole morning doing a word study, but, but I think to get this in context today, uh, we need to look at least three, maybe four words of this, because they're important. And the first word is amazed. Some of your Bibles may say astonished. When you see that word, it's very rare in Scripture, and here's how I want to, to frame it for, for you today. What Paul is saying is, my mind is blown Okay, that's the equivalent of that. He's saying, my mind is blown about something. And since that's so rare, that means whatever is blowing his mind is really worth paying attention to. 
And that's the second word, and it's the word deserting. Now, the word deserting is interesting, because uh, we, we kind of know what that word means, but in the first century context, everybody knew without a shadow of a doubt that was a military term. But here's what we think when we think deserting. We hear deserting, we think AWOL, absent without leave. A soldier leaves his unit and runs away. That's not the military term that deserting meant in the first century. It meant literally changing camps. So it wasn't running away, it was switching sides. And so the thing that's blowing Paul's mind here is that these people are so quickly switching sides. They are switching camps. And what they're doing in switching that is this. He says that you were called by the grace of Christ. When you hear the word grace, I want you to think freedom, okay, because this is military terms. So think freedom. He says for a different gospel. And if you've been in the church even two minutes, when I ask you what does the word gospel mean, you're going to tell me, well, it means the... The good news, right? We've all heard that. That's not an incorrect definition. Uh, but, but if you don't understand why it's the good news, uh, it's, it's not a complete definition. Because the word gospel in the first century, guess what? You're going to see a theme. It was also a military term. And here's what it meant. It meant there had been a military decree uh, that an army was about to be dispensed that was going to fight a battle on your behalf to bring you salvation, to set you free from your captors. So it was a military turn. The reason the gospel is the good news is because there's been an act of war made on your behalf to set you free from your captors. Amen. And so to put all of this in context, this is what Paul is saying. He says, my mind is blown that you are so quickly deserting the freedom that you have tasted and you're switching sides. Okay, that, that's what he's saying and he goes on to, to say it like this, because, because you have to ask, why? Why would they taste the freedom of Jesus? Why would they taste the salvation he offers and then switch so quickly? Why would that blow Paul's mind? Because they're ignorant, right? Because they've heard something. Because there is a lie that they don't see. It looks good, and they've believed it, and it's subtle, and it's causing them to switch sides. Because look what Paul says. And from 6, he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. 7, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So he's saying, you think this is good news. You're seeing something that you think brings you salvation, but it's not. And the reason it's not is because those that are bringing this message, what is their intent? We are told their intent is actually to disturb you. Now that word disturb, here's what it means. It means to throw into confusion, to shake, to agitate, or to excite to the point of perplexity and fear. Friends, that's the goal of the enemy. That's the goal of the enemy to, to bring us, to, to perplex us, to bring us to fear, to disturb our lives, to discourage us. And so these people that are bringing this false gospel, that's what they're doing. They are coming to disturb our lives with these lies that look good on the outside, but they're really not good. And what's important is how they're doing it. By distorting the gospel of Christ. Some of your Bibles will say the word pervert by distorting or perverting the good news or the salvation that Jesus brought. And here's what we do. When we think of false teachers, we think of people that don't believe in Jesus. Or we think of people that deny the resurrection. Or we think of people that deny that Jesus was God. And while that's certainly false, let me tell you what's more dangerous. It is people that are halfway there. It's people that say, no, Jesus was real, but this is really the way to salvation. It's people that, that claim belief in Jesus, that claim his way to salvation is good, but they've twisted it or distorted it in order to disturb us. See, what we call that is a half-truth. That's more dangerous because a flat-out lie we recognize. But half-truths, what do they? They look good. They sound good. If we don't really know God's word, we'll give in to them because of our ignorance. And Paul says a half-truth. Well, that's not really a truth at all because here's what Satan does. He takes what God has given us, which is good and which is true, and he just twists it just a little bit. <laughs> he perverts it just a little bit. And so it looks good to us, and we give in to it, and then we realize this isn't what it seemed at all. Let, let me give you a few examples. It is true that Jesus offers us grace when we mess up. 
It is true that we don't have to live in fear of our mistakes. It is half true that everybody can just live however they want because God loves and forgives everybody. Do you see it? That's not true. That's a half truth. Right? So, so it's not true. We, we don't get to say, I'm just going to move in with my boyfriend or girlfriend because God just wants us to love. He just wants commitment, and he's good with it because he loves me and he forgives me. It's half true that I can say I can be in, in fill-in-the-blank sexual relationship because there's too many to mention, there's too many options, and that brings less confusion or more. Right? And so it's, it's false that I can live in whatever fill-in-the-blank sexual relationship I want because God just wants me to be happy and God saves everybody and God forgives everybody no matter what they do. See, it was a truth, but it's been distorted. It looks good, it sounds good, but if we don't understand God's intent, if we don't understand God's way for us, if we're not in here, then we're gonna believe it. And what's it going to do? It's, it's not another gospel at all. It won't save you, it'll do the opposite because you've changed camp. See, see, it's meant to disturb us. It's meant to cause anxiety. It's meant to cause fear. It was a truth, now it's a half truth. Let's go again, let's try another one. It is true that we can do good things. It is true that God has equipped us to do good works. I can go out, I can give a homeless person money, that's a good thing. I can care for someone, that's a good thing. But it is half true that that makes me a good person. Okay, or even worse, even worse when we say, well, I don't do bad things, therefore I'm a good person. Because here's what we say. We say, you know what, I don't, I don't steal. I don't cheat on my spouse. I don't murder people. And I do some good things. I put money in the plate at church. So, right, we, we say these things, which means I'm good. When I die, I know where I'm going. That's a lie, it's a disturbing lie meant to confuse us and cause anxiety and fear. It was truth, but Satan twisted it just a little bit. It's not truth anymore. Now it's a half truth. And now it leads us not to, but away from Jesus. Yeah. See, they're subtle. If you don't know God's word, you'll look at it and you'll say, sure, that sounds great. Let's try one more. This one's really important today. If you don't understand this, you need to. It is true that our words have power. It is true that we can accomplish a lot of things on this earth. It is half true that we can create our own reality. It is half true that we can speak anything into existence. It is half true that we control all outcomes in our life. Because here's what, here's what we do, and here's the new philosophy. It's that my words have so much power that I create my own reality. And if I say the right things the right way, and if I do certain things, I will always control the outcome. See, it was truth. But Satan got in there and he just perverted it. He twisted it. Now it's a half truth. It was good for us. Now it's meant to disturb us. Now it's meant to, to make us confused. Now it's to, to make us fear. Because it was true, now it's a half truth. And here's what you have to say. All of those half truths, what makes them half truths is this. It started with a truth. Something Jesus gave us. Something the one that was perfect gave us. Something the one that is warring on our behalf to offer us salvation gave us. It was true. It was good. And Satan just twisted it a little bit. That's all he does. But here's what all of these things do. They move our reliance from being totally and wholly on Jesus and it puts it back on us on my decision, on my effort, on my authority. And when we are in our own power, we are not in his. Amen. And let me tell you, friends, you do not want to go and meet your maker and sit on that judgment seat and be your own defense. You don't. Because you know what the standard is? The standard isn't good. The standard is perfect. And every single one of us has failed. And so we can't believe these half-truths about salvation and where it comes from that Satan feeds us because it, it, doesn't just, it doesn't just hurt a little bit. It walks us away from his saving grace. Because look what happens here. This is what Paul is dealing with. This is what he's dealing with in the first ch church. It doesn't matter. Some people say Judaizers or Hellenists, maybe some Gnostics were in there. Listen, it doesn't matter who it was. All of those people, here's what they did. They added to or took away from something that Jesus said about salvation. So all of these philosophies were coming into the early church, and you know what it gave people? More choices. Yep. Is that a good thing? Because people certainly be attracted to more choices, but they won't commit to anything. Right? Because here, here's what happens. This is familiar. This is our culture. This is today. Because the one thing that our culture despises about Jesus more than anything else is that he is the only yes. way 
to salvation. Our culture despises that he is the only way. Listen, we don't need more choices. We only need one. More choices, they'll confuse us, they'll make us fearful. We won't commit to anything. We simply need the choice. Do we commit to being Lord of our own life or letting the one that's warring on our behalf do it for us? The one that paid with his blood do it for us. But Satan confuses people. He twists them. It's half truths, which is why Paul says this. Verse 8, he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what he preached, he is to be accursed. Because as we have said before, I say now again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what is received, he is to be accursed. This is the harshest language found anywhere in scripture. You won't find this anywhere else. Some commentators try, try to, to push it away because it sounds too harsh. Don't push it away. It's meant to be harsh. Paul says anybody that twists or contorts the way to salvation offered only by the blood of Jesus Christ, to that person shall they be cursed now, shall they be cursed for eternity, because what they have done is they've led people away from the cross. And we can't treat that casually because then people will spend eternity suffering away from him. So let them be cursed now, let them be cursed for eternity. But here's the problem. If we're following a cursed teacher and their cursed teachings, whether intentionally or not, what does that put us under? Curse. That's what I mean when I say hidden curses. We're following something that looks good on the outside, it sounds good on the outside, but inside it's trash. A hidden curse, a disturbing lie meant to discourage you from living the life that God has called you to live. So that's that's what I mean when I say disturbing lies are always at the root of discouraged lives. Now you might look up here this morning and realize we've got some stage decorations, right? I didn't sleep here last night, okay, I promise. This isn't normally what this looks like. But let me me tell you, let me explain it like this. I come from a long line of campers in my family. Uh, My parents, my grandparents, they all own trailers. They travel all around Indiana and Ohio camping. And what that means is this. When Chris and I go home, oftentimes we aren't going to stay at my parents' house. We're finding them wherever they are camping. And that has taught me a couple things through the years. Because what I've realized is this. We could go to the same campground. They are in the same camper. They have the same food. It's the same weekend out of the year. And yet it can be a completely different experience. Because there's a difference between getting that spot in the main field next to the playground, close enough to walk to the private bathrooms, far enough away you don't smell them, and getting the spot backed up next to the cesspool that's a mosquito breeding ground downwind from the campground outhouse. Those are two different experiences. And so what I'm hoping you, hoping you can understand with this series is this, is that when we think about the contrast between living our lives under the curse and under these hidden lies, I want you to think about camping, because whether it's it's here or whether it's there, we're all camping, but our experience is going to depend greatly on where we've set up camp. That changes everything for us. Where we've set up camp makes a big difference, and so if you're here this morning, and maybe you were attracted by the question, or, or maybe you just hear the question and it hits you, but you hear the question, why am I unhappy? Here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you an answer. You say, why am I unhappy? It's because at some point you have believed a lie. You have submitted to a hidden curse. Maybe even the curse of believing that more options will make you happier. But also part of your problem this morning is the question itself. And I know I wrote the question. I'm allowed to do that. Okay. Part of the, the problem is with the question itself. And that word, happy. Let me explain it like this. Our one-year-old does not like to be changed. So Krista and I, early on, we adopted what we call, you're all familiar with it, the distraction method. And so this is what we did. We would go take her to the changing table, and we would sing as animatedly as we can at the top of our lungs with all the motions, do it with me if you've heard it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Do we need to do verse two? We good? 
No, God, I heard some big notes from him. Listen, here's, here's my problem with the word happy. It has no definition. We can't define it. In fact, from the earliest age, we tell our children, if you're happy, then you'll know it. Your face will show it. Surely. Right? We can't even tell our children what happy is. You don't believe me? Look up the definition. Actually, don't bother. I did it for you. Here's the definition of happy. Favored by luck or fortune, notably fitting, effective or well-adapted, enjoying or characterized by well-being and contentment, expressing happiness. That is not a definition. <laughs> you can't define that. You can't measure that. You can't value that. You know why we like the word happy? Because it's a half truth. Here's the thing about happy. We get to decide when we're happy and nobody else can tell us otherwise. We get to choose happy and say, I'm happy. And you can't tell me I'm not happy. I hate the word happy. There is no definition to happy. But look at that, de look at that definition. Look at some of those words real quick. I see some words in there. I see the word favored. I see the word effective. I see well adapted. I see the word joy. I see the word contentment. Do you know what those are? Those are Bible words. Those are Bible words that not only can we define, but those are Bible words that either we can identify or someone else can identify us as people that are walking in Jesus. You want to talk about happy? Happy is favored, affected, well adapted, joy, and contentment. Friends, those are evidences of a life marked by Jesus. Let me tell you how the song should go. If you're favored and you know it, clap your hands. If you've got joy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're content and you know it, you know what then? Your life will surely show it. If you are content, then you'll know it. Say amen. Amen. Friends, that's the way that song should go. Doesn't mean we're going to start singing it at changing time. I forgot the words right now. But listen, happy is a lie. Happy, you can't define that. You can define these other things because those are identifiers of a life that is in Jesus. It is, it is a lie that the more choices you have, the happier you will be. The truth is, is that we only have one real choice to make, and it's this. Where will you set up camp? Let me finish with this real quick story of a friend of mine. I, I met this guy a few years ago. His life was in a pretty rough spot. He's a good friend of mine. I love him dearly, but he had a very rough childhood. His dad was sent away to prison. His mom didn't want kids. She didn't like kids. She hated her life. So here's what she did. She was at a different bar every night, rarely came home. When she did, it was with a different guy. He had to raise himself and his sister. He gets out on his own. He took a few lies out into the world with him. He took the lie that he's not lovable because if he was, why would his parents have done those things? He took the lie that he can't trust anybody, he has to do everything himself because nobody ever did anything for him. He believed the lie that it would never get better because that was the only life he ever knew. He turned to drugs, turned to alcohol to numb the pain, couldn't hold down a job, couldn't provide for himself, found a girlfriend, moved in with her. She was significantly older, had a young kid. She had daddy issues, he had mommy issues. They set up camp over here. Their life was a mess. And then something happened. They came to church one day. It's funny, most people whose lives are a mess know it. We don't have to tell them usually. They know it. And he heard about salvation. He heard about freedom. He heard about grace. He heard about things he never heard about. And he said he wanted to be baptized. And he wanted to walk in truth. So we baptized him. And I started meeting with him. And listen, we had some hard conversations early on. Hard conversations. I would tell him things like, you can't say you're a fully committed and devoted follower of Jesus and be living with your girlfriend. Those things are at odds with each other. I don't have anywhere to live. God promises he'll provide for that. Pray about it. Housing, just like that. I've seen it over and over again. And it doesn't mean that everything got easy. He was still triggered. He still had a lot of emotional trauma. He still went back to the bottle. He'd come in, he'd meet with me, he'd be hung over. Say, so scale one to 10, how hung over are you on today? Eight. Here's coffee, let's talk. Because listen, you're not a slave to this anymore. God's grace covers the fact that you messed up. You're not a slave to this anymore. Scripture tells us if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. It's time to resist. We do different now. And listen, he, he did. 
turned off the TV, watched media less, got into the, the Word of God more, started to read truth about who God says he is, about the freedom that God's given him. He started to walk in that truth, started to walk in joy, peace. Started being kind, enjoyed his job. Things were getting better. I met with him up in one morning. Still remember it vividly. And he gets there and he starts, he says something weird. He says, I feel like I heard from God for the first time in my life. I think he, is it weird? I think he, he wants me to be a minister. I said, that's not weird at all, man. God told me that like a month ago. I was just waiting for him to tell you. So I said, here's what I think you need to do. I think you need to, I think you need to leave this behind. I think you need a fresh start. You need some space. You, you need a season to just have this with no distractions. So you want to be a minister? I think Bible college is a place that you can make that happen. So I think, I think it's what you're called to. He said, man, I've never had so much hope. I've never had so much joy, so much peace. I've never had a future. Everything is different. He had to go home and tell his girlfriend. Here's what she did. She sat him down and she, she put on a napkin. She drew all these little circles around the edge of the napkin. She put her and her son in one of them, his friends, his hobbies, all things that he liked. Then she drew a big circle in the middle, it was empty, and she said, do you know what goes in here? And he said, Jesus? And she said, no, that's where you go. She said, you have to make choices that make you happy. She said, you have to choose the life that you want. And you have all these options and all these decisions, and the only thing that's gonna make you happy is you choosing and your choices and all these other things. By the time he told me that, he was already moved back in with her. He's already back on drugs. He's already drinking again. My mind was blown at how quickly he switched camps again. Just like that. Because he believed a lie. A lie that looked good, that more choices is always a good thing. It's not. My friends, you have one choice. You have, you have one choice to make. Because the problem is, the more choices you believe is out there, the less likely you are to commit to anything. But when it comes to Jesus, I promise you there is never going to be anything better. Which means the only choice that matters is where you set up camp. Do you let Jesus be Lord of the life or are you gonna hold on to that for yourself? That is the only choice that matters. So, so let me tell you what this looks like. You can set up camp over here. You can. That's your choice. But let me challenge you with this. If you're going to set up camp over here, be devoted to it. Sleep with whoever you want, whenever you want, whatever you want. Same time, doesn't matter. Get drunk, be on drugs, cheat on your wife. It doesn't matter. Do whatever feels good. Do all of it and commit to it and be over here because this is as good as your life will ever get. Might as well try to enjoy it. But let me tell you this too, nobody that's ever been devoted to this life with a straight face would tell you they're happy. Nobody. Because you know what? This building's made of trash. Sin's fun for a time, but that building will always collapse. Let me tell you what else you can do. You can come over here. You accept camp with Jesus. And you give him your life. And you know what you get in return? You get his grace and his freedom and his salvation, his joy, his peace, his patience. And let me tell you something else. That's as good as your life's gonna get. This is a great reflection of heaven. It still gets better than this. This is pretty good, but this ain't it yet. It gets better still because this ain't home. We're just camping. It's just for a time. So, So let me tell you this, friends. I'm gonna talk to two different groups of people here for a second. If you're here, and you're a Christian, you say, I follow Jesus, and you walk around constantly discouraged, somewhere at the root of that is a lie. Somewhere there's a, there's a root of that, something you've believed that's not really truth. And here's what you can do. It's another military term in the Bible. It's called repent. It just means about face. It just means turn away from the way you're walking and walk the other direction. You've wandered into this camp. Repentance just means we do this and we walk back over here. And because of Jesus, there is no fear in that. There is no shame in that. There is no guilt in that. It's a get out of jail free card. You're in this one, you get to be over there and all you have to do is say, God, I'm sorry, I wanna be back here. That's it. 
Start living differently. So listen, we got prayer benches down here. You can come down to the prayer bench. You can do it at your seat. It doesn't matter. But if you are, are constantly discouraged, your response at this point is not, woe is me. Your response is, I'm sorry. Because I'm living under the curse, not under the life. The life's over here. Come back home. But you might be here this morning, and you know your life's a mess. You know it ain't working. And you've never seen hope before. If you're camping over here, you can choose today to camp over here. You can be over here. And here's what, you can come forward, you talk to me while we're playing this next song. Maybe the the conversation lasts between services, it doesn't matter. But we'll talk for a minute. We will baptize you. We've got clothes up there, it doesn't matter. Even if you go home wet, it doesn't matter. You will come out of that water. I will connect you with someone that will walk with you and show you and explain to you the truth of God and his word and what he says about you. And let me tell you this morning, there is no better off for coming. There is no better off. There's nothing coming that is worth waiting for. That is the best offer you will get. So this morning as we end, I I just need you to understand that disturbing lies are always at the root of a discouraged life, but it doesn't have to be that way. You get a choice. Are you staying up camp here? Or are you camping over here? Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you that though we deserted you, you chased us. And Father, I thank you that even though my will is weak, even though sometimes my immaturity shows through in ways that are embarrassing, that you still went to the cross. God, I thank you that you have grafted us into your family, that you have offered us a home with you that's not just temporary, but that's forever. So God, I want to pray right now over everybody in this audience, everybody in this church family, that I know there's people out there that woke up this morning and asked, why do I keep doing this? I know there's people out here that woke up today and said, I can't keep doing this. I know there's people in here that said, this is too much. And to every single one of those people, you stretched out your arms on that cross and said, come home. Come home. So God, I ask that you give us the courage to about face. I ask that you give us the courage to walk forward. I ask that your spirit would set us free from the bondage of the enemy because the gospel is that you warred on our behalf to set us free. So God, this morning... Just let us come home, beckon us home. Let your spirit draw us home with you. In Jesus' name I pray.